Welcome back. If you're just joining us, uh, those that are just joining us, uh, with this is Portland Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Currently, we're meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. So if you're out and about in, uh, in the area, Portland, Vancouver area, come by. Uh, Sunday, 10 o'clock, 1115 right now. And after our second service, we have about a half hour. We sing the great hymns of the church, great time of fellowship and worship. And then on Thursday, we have class at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're doing the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter one there. And if, after our Thursday night service, we have prayer meetings. So if you have prayer requests, praises, or thanksgiving, give us a call or drop us a line. We'll include your prayer request or praise. So we can do that. And then on Wednesday, my wife Judy here at the table with us uh, has a class for the ladies currently teaching and studying the Old Testament prophet Elisha. So you can join with her on Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We did mention the fact that uh, uh, there's a program on the television on TBN, uh, the Rosenberg Report, Joel Rosenberg, written a number of novels. <laughs> Interesting thing, he writes novels and then they come to pass. So I don't know what that's all about. At any rate, uh, he does a great news show on what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, two, two sessions ago, he gave his testimony and talked about how uh, his, his uh, count, I don't know how they did the count, uh, there's about a, nearly a million Hebrew people that have come to faith in their Messiah. So great. And then the last uh, presentation he talked about, uh, that as far as they could tell, over a million Muslims have come to faith in Jesus Christ. So you're going to get news there that you won't get anywhere else. Thursday night, set your DVR, the Rosenberg Report. And again, if you want to give to the Ministry of Portland Bible Church, you can do that. You can send it to my address. Make sure you put Portland Bible Church on the outside of the envelope, and I put it right into the box. Make sure your check has Portland Bible Church on it as well. I don't handle the money. All of our uh, finances are handled by our deacon board. So appreciate that. Pray about your giving. And uh, we thank you very much, those who've been faithful over the years. Uh, to the ministry that God has given us at Portland Bible Church. It's our custom to take a few moments, as you know, for silent prayer at the beginning of each class to make sure that we're in fellowship. We acknowledge any sins that we're aware of, courtesy of the scripture, which says if we, believers, confess our sins, that is the ones that we're uh, currently uh, remembering through the power of the Holy Spirit, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that picks up not only the ones we confess and know, but the ones perhaps we forgot or didn't know about. And then we have the enabling and fulfill the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the mind of Christ which is the Word of God. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study in this second hour, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we count it a privilege and an honor to be members of your royal family through our faith alone in your Son, Jesus Christ, and his finished work on the cross, providing our so great salvation. We pray as we study this morning now that your spirit will enable us to understand the principles and the scriptures that we have before us, that you'd edify our souls, build us up, cause us to desire to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. We look forward to the time when your Son will come for us, and that we will come before that judgment bar and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, as we study this morning, edify our souls, and we pray it in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word in this second hour to the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 17. We're about midway through verse 17. First hour, we looked at the closure of the parenthetical section, verses 13 through 16. Now we're back to Abraham again. We might say uh, Abraham part two. <laughs> uh, or what do they call it in the, in the tech? Uh, Abraham 2.0. <laughs> so we have Abraham by faith. 
And it says here, uh, when he was tested. I like the word tested rather than tempted there. And we noted where we left off last time with this word tested or tempted. In the Greek, it's a single word. It's pyrazo. It's uh, spelled this way, P-E-I-R-A-D-Z-O, pyrazo. And in the lexicon, it says to try, to test, to tempt, to entice. Uh, and so trials and tests are different from temptations. And I did a study of this one time. We won't go through the whole thing now. But basically, there is a difference between testing and temptation. And the difference is this. A test is what God gives to all of us. We are tested daily. In fact, our life on this earth is really a test. One, to see whether we will accept the plan that God has through faith alone in His Son, Jesus Christ. And the daily tests that we have dealing with all manner of adversity and also blessing. How will we deal with blessing? How will we deal with adversity? It's a test. Now, when does a test become a temptation? Same word in the Greek. The context determines whether it's a test or a temptation. The best I can determine is that a test becomes a temptation when we begin to apply the things of the old sin nature, cosmic principles, as a solution to the test. When we do that, it becomes a temptation. If instead a test comes and we apply the word of God, then the test stays a test and we pass the test, as it were, with flying colors. So if we want to avoid temptation, we need to have our old sin nature under control through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Confess any sins that we're aware of so that we have that enabling of the Holy Spirit. And then any test that we're faced with, we will use the resources the divine operating assets in our various facets of the soul to apply doctrine and principles of the Word of God to that test and pass. If instead we apply the old sin nature and all of the lusts of the old sin nature, the ego lust, the approbation lust, all of those things, power lust, monetary lust, if we apply those to solve the solution, as the world says, just throw money at it. The world's solution to everything is just throw money at it and, this, and it'll be solved. And of course, obviously, that's a cosmic solution. Instead, we put faith as the means whereby we overcome adversity, we overcome fear. Uh, obviously, we've said that uh, faith is the antidote to fear. Well, faith is the antidote to every test every adversity that confronts us so that we apply the some 7,000 or some say 30,000 promises in Scripture. By the way, I've never counted them. If you want to do a project sometime, count all the promises in Scripture. Now, again, they're not all for us. Some of them are to Israel specifically. Some are to individuals. But there's certainly thousands of promises in Scripture that we can claim, and those promises lead to principles that allow us to live a righteous life. We're righteous because of our imputation from Jesus Christ at the moment of salvation. But being righteous by imputation and living a righteous life, two different things. It's just like someone born into royalty. They are in the royal family, such as we think of uh, in England or places that have royal families. Well, a young person is part of royalty, but they may not have behavior that demonstrates that they are noble or they are royal family. Same is true of us. We are royalty by, per, by the fact that Christ has purchased us and entered us into union with him in eternity and seated at the right hand of the Father. And so we have righteousness by imputation. But we need to demonstrate that righteousness throughout our lives. And that occurs any time we are tested. By the way, at the first hour we were talking about James... And I, I wanted to get the correct verse there. We see in verses 2 through 4 of chapter 1 the idea of testing. And there it says uh, here that uh, we encounter various trials. It's one of those passages, by the way, that we, we quote sometimes but almost don't like. And that's because it says, Consider it a joy, my brethren, believers, when you encounter various trials or tests. See, that's the same thing. It's either the verb pyrazo or the noun form cognate. And therefore, trials here, uh, in this case, it's pyrosmos, the noun. Trials, uh, some would say temptations. But again, we note a distinction between trials and temptation. Same word in the noun form or the verb cognate, which is the verb form of the same Greek stem. 
And so here it's translated tests or trials. The New American Standard, let's see, in the margin, if you'll notice, it says temptation. So that the writers of uh, the book of James in translation, they thought, well, it's trials, but could be temptation. So they didn't make that distinction. And so the context, in my opinion, in my study of the Greek, and the fact that a word can be used differently in different contexts. We do the same thing in English. We ought not be surprised. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let your endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect, better yet, complete, and complete, lacking in nothing. If you lack wisdom, ask the Lord. And so we have the concept here of tests. And then we go down to verse 12. Once again, same form. Blessed is the man who perseveres, bears up, we might say, uh, under trial or test. Pyrosma, same root form. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Part of the rewards that we receive at the judgment seat of Christ is the crown of life, or in the Greek, the wreath of righteousness. The word is stephanos, not diadem in the Greek, a crown that a king wears, such as Jesus Christ. Uh, we receive the victor's crown as one in an athletic game uh, is the victor's wreath. So it would be the wreath of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so part of demonstrating the righteousness that God has imputed to us in this life will give us the reward of the Stephanos, the victor's wreath of life. So it says here, how? When you persevere under trials. However, when we go over to chapter 2, James chapter 2 and verse 21, uh, let's see, is that the one I wanted? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 13. I'm going to the test here. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, 1, 1, 13. 13 through 15. Notice the difference here. Now it says in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted. Now they change the same word, but I submit the word should be tested. And so let no one say when he is tested, I am being tempted by God. In other words, it's the same word, but when you're being tested, don't say that God is tempting you. The temptation, as he's going to say in the next verse, is going to be from your old sin nature. So I would disagree here with the commentary, and you may disagree with me, and that's all right. But as I said, I designate a difference because indiscriminately, uh, in many texts, they translate these words uh, either way, temptation or testing. And I make a di distinction because up there, obviously, in uh, verse 2, the same word was translated trial or test. Down here, suddenly, they make a temptation. So when he is tested, when you're tested, don't say, I'm being tempted by God. Because God does test us. And you can't say, well, uh, I'm saying God tests me. He does test us. So it has two different senses. On the one hand, don't say you're being tempted uh, uh, by God when you're being tested. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Therefore, God is not tempted with evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. Well... <laughs> There's a conundrum. There someone says, that's a contradiction. On the one hand, he says, I'm being tempted. Don't say that. On the other hand, uh, he says that God doesn't tempt anyone. Well, okay, so he can't tempt you. But here in the first part of the verse, it says, uh, that, uh, let no one say that he is tempted. And so the point is, is it tempted or temptation? I'll try to clarify it as I go through it. Here it is. Let no one say when he is tested. If you like tempted, but I like tested. I am being tempted by God, okay? Uh, that means that you're going to apply the old sin nature. And then he says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone, uh, tempt anyone. Well, if he doesn't tempt, yet he tests, and we know from Scripture, clearly he tests us, but it's the same word in the Greek. So the context determines whether it's testing or temptation. Well, what, what makes the difference? Read on. Each one is tempted, here it is, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. So the test 
becomes a temptation when we are carried away and enticed by the lust pattern of our old sin nature. Now, in the past, we have taught the doctrine of the old sin nature. I think it's at the website. And we've taught about the lust pattern, some eight or nine lusts that are the motivating factors within the old sin nature. We've studied all of that. We don't have time to develop it now. But there is a pattern that lends to the old sin nature lusts, whether it's the lust for power, the lust for money, the lust for sex, the lust to move somewhere to get a better uh, place to live, all different kinds of lusts that are described in Scripture. And so the lusts motivate what we already have in our gene structure and old nature, the Adamic nature. It's called the old sin nature, as old as Adam. It, for him, it was a new sin nature. For us, it's genetically linked to the uh, cell structure. And so here it says that you're enticed by your own lust. When lust has conceived as part of the old sin nature, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now, that doesn't mean you die physically, of course. It has to do with temporal death being spiritually out of fellowship. That's why we need 1 John 1, 9. It's not complicated. It's just what happens when you look at these Greek words sometimes in one context. It seems, on the one hand, that God's tempting us. Another place, he's testing us. Then it says he doesn't tempt us. Well, does he or doesn't he? Well, he tests us, but we basically tempt ourselves. He doesn't tempt us. We take the test, and instead of applying the word of God, we apply cosmic, worldly thinking to it. At that point, the lust pattern rears its ugly head. It says here, we're carried away by our own lust. And when the lust has conceived, it produces a sin, and when sin, it produces death. And, of course, this is the idea. So I hope I've developed that at least. So in this passage, Abraham was not tempted. He was tested. Guess what? He didn't apply the old sin nature. He did what God told him to do. Now, he struggled originally when God promised him uh, that he would have a son because he laughed about it. I don't know that he failed the test, but obviously uh, uh, God's sense of humor allowed his son to be called laughter. Okay. But before that, he had faith and he left Ur of the Chaldees. He left the worship of the moon god and his father, Terah. He left those and went to a place he didn't know where he was going. God just says, go and I'll show you where to go. And he went. So he had faith. Sarah had faith, finally, based on the faith of her husband Abraham, and they had Isaac. And so another test came along. It's the test of offering his only born son, uh, this uniquely born son. It wasn't his only son because he had already had Ishmael by the handmaid, Hagar. But his only born son, that was of the promise. And therefore, uh, this, of course, he was born, and uh, he was supposed to offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, when you see this, it says, well, God, that's a cruel God. He says, kill your son and burn him up in a sacrifice like a lamb uh, uh, that would be offered, a holocaust offering, where they burned up the entire animal uh, on the altar and there was nothing left but ashes. Wow. And he's going to do that with his son. Now, the only thing that I can think, and Scripture bears this out, by the way, in the book of Hebrews, as we're going to see, uh, and also, of course, in Genesis, although it doesn't spell out every detail, quite like the book of Hebrews and elsewhere we see, but the faith of Abraham must have been this. I paraphrase. Abraham thought, well, okay. I know that you've got a promise to me and you're going to keep it. And my son Isaac is going to be heir. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants. That is the sand of the seashore, the dust of the earth, and the stars of the heaven. And you're telling me to kill him? Well, God, I believe you. And if I kill him, you're going to raise him from the dead. He understood resurrection just like Job did in the book of Job. He talks about seeing his Redeemer without his flesh. Not without the Redeemer's flesh, but without Job's flesh. When he dies, he's going to see the Redeemer, Jesus Christ of the future. Abraham knew that there was resurrection. And therefore, that if he killed Isaac and burned him up on the altar, God would raise him out of the ashes and he would go on to be his uh, descendant and all of the descendants that would follow uh, Jacob and the uh, sons of Jacob and so forth. And so that's what he believed. Now, that's pretty incredible. Now, God doesn't usually have us do these kinds of things uh, in faith. And yet the simplest thing that God gives us as a test 
Nine times out of ten, we fail it. Oh, no, God. Oh, now what? What am I going to do now? And I'm as guilty as most of y'all. I know some of you say, oh, I just trust God every time. Do you? <laughs> we won't ask a show of hands of anybody that never has failed to be faithful to the Lord in all things. We've all failed many times. We're human. We have all sin natures. We try to cut down on that. We try to make sure we're filled with the Spirit. We have that additional aid under the divine operating assets, the filling of the Holy Spirit. But we can neutralize it through allowing a test to become a temptation and a temptation through the lust pattern to become a sin. And then we're out of fellowship and then off to the races. Uh, we have failed the test. Abraham didn't fail that test. And it's a marvel to me. What faith? Well, you say, well, he left Ur of the Chaldee and God took him there and he gave the son Isaac. But now this is just this is just goes beyond the pale. Kill your son and burn him up to a crisp just doesn't sound reasonable any reasonable human being say god you know enough already look i've done all these things i'm not i'm not going to do this. you promised that he would be my heir abraham didn't flinch and we're going to see that and so of course you can go over if you will to genesis 22 so now we take a journey back in time and that's what i love about the book of hebrews as i said particularly chapter 11 because here he goes back and references. Now, if you are Hebrew, you know the whole story. Even if you've been in this Bible class and in Portland Bible Church for a number of years, we've been there. We've gone through this. But for those who may just be joining us, for the average church goer, they never go back to the Old Testament. Sometimes they even say, well, that was then and this is now and we don't have to go to the Old Testament. We're New Testament believers. Well, we're church age believers, but we're Bible believers as well. And the whole Bible, we have no New Testament if it were not for what the, what's called the Old Testament, the Torah. And there we have the basis of whatever we have in Christ. As a matter of fact, this test is basically a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only son, so to speak, of God uh, in human form through the incarnation would be sacrificed and he would be killed and he would be raised from the dead. So this sacrifice that Abraham is asked to make of his son is kind of a prototype, even though he didn't really kill him, he could have. But he didn't have to because Abraham demonstrated he was going to do it. He had the knife. He was ready to kill his son. He had him bound and put on the altar. And uh, uh, he was ready to do it. And God says, enough. I, I believe you're going to do it. And you don't have to do it. But God allowed his son to die and to be resurrected. And that's the basis of our so great salvation. So those who say the Old Testament is not important fail to understand how important it really is. We have no New Testament apart from the Old Testament. And as one Hebrew believer suggested one time, the New Testament is Jewish. <laughs> Everybody think, well, we believe in the New Testament, but forget that Old Testament. We're Gentiles. We don't follow that Jewish stuff. Listen, the book of Hebrews is all about Jews. It's all about the Old Testament. It's all about how uh, they need to accept their Messiah. And even though many have not, ultimately, according to Paul in Romans chapter 11, in the future, all all Israel will be saved and the Abrahamic covenant will be totally fulfilled in the land, all of those great things. Well, I digress. But Genesis chapter 22, really, this whole chapter, verses 1 through 18, and I'm going to read the text here because there's no way to summarize this. So here we go. Now it came about, I'm in Genesis 22, 1, after these things that God tested Abraham he didn't tempt him, did he? He tested him. It's the same Greek word in the Septuagint translating the Hebrew word for tempt. But it's translated test because the context demands testing. He didn't fail the test and therefore let it become a temptation. As James chapter 1 suggests, he was tested. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Abraham said in response, here I am. And he said to him, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. 
Uh, you don't have to have Hebrew to get the point. A burnt offering is what's called a holocaust offering. Jesus Christ wasn't burned alive on the, on the cross, but he is the result of what the burnt offering suggested. The burnt offering was the animal was completely incinerated. And those ashes were the remains that, of course, were sprinkled and so forth. And so we had the blood sprinkled, the ashes and all of that. And so he's going to take him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Didn't even tell him where to go, Mount Moriah. There's more than one peak there. And he's going to guide him as he has all the way. And he said, and of course, uh, and Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Notice he doesn't say, what? Kill my son? Are you crazy? What kind of God demands that? Not a word. He simply gets up. He gets the wood ready. He gets two of his servants. He grabs his son and says, uh, we're going on a mission. <laughs> Doesn't explain it, obviously. Uh, Isaac might have said, what did, what? what did God say? I don't think he described it to him at this point. And so on the third day, he rose, raised his eyes and saw the place at a distance. God had told him where to go. And Abram said to the young man, stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship. Listen to this. Future tense. This is what's called the imperfect tense in the Hebrew. We shall return. We. <laughs> He's going to offer him up as a burnt offering. And yet he has the moxie, well, we should say the faith to believe that God's going to raise him from the dead. He has to. He says, stay here with the donkey. Take care of it. Uh, we're going to go a little further up. And we will worship and we will return. Whew. Is that powerful or what? If we only had that kind of faith. Jesus said when he comes back to the earth, he told his disciples, will I find faith on the earth? If he came back today and looked around, looked at the churches, looked at the average believer, would he find faith? Do we have faith? What do we see in the churches today? Lies, deceit, apostasy, fear. Close the doors, wear a mask. Take, get a shot. Do anything that the government suggests. What happened to our faith, people? What happened? Will Jesus find faith? I digress. At any rate, here he says, I, we, will, we will return. We. First person plural. Abraham took the wood and the burn, uh, uh, of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, on his son. Boy, there's a prophecy. What happened to Jesus? They laid the cross on him. He carried his own cross up to Golgotha. This is a beautiful picture. He lay, he could have put it, he could have carried it in a bundle. He had Isaac carry it on his back like Jesus carried the cross. You don't think this is prophetic? And so it says, uh, 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 and he took it in his hand, the fire. So he had some fire. He, I don't know if he used the Boy Scout method, you know, or whatever. He had some means of producing fire and like a torch or something. And so it says, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So apparently he had uh, some type of a, I guess a torch is all I could figure, with some kind of combustible pitch. doesn't tell us. It just says he took the fire in his hand. He didn't have a handful of fire. He had some instrument. You know, he had his lighter. He had his uh, whatever, his, his special lighter that we use for lighting our can. No, some type of a torch. And so it says he took that in his hand. And so uh, he says, uh, let me find out here. Okay, uh, and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And he probably was asking him at that point, uh, uh, Father, I, we didn't bring a, a lamb up here. Uh, so the discussion starts to go on, you see, for some time. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, and he says, uh, Here am I, my son. You know, like, where am I going? I'm right here. You're asking me. Just say whatever it is. And, and he said, uh, Behold the fire, uh, the wood's on my back, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? So now he's beginning to get a little nervous. <laughs> and Abraham said, here's a quintessential key verse to the whole chapter. God will provide for himself. He didn't say you're the sacrifice. He said God will provide for himself the lamb. Now there's the prophecy. God the Father provided for himself, Jesus Christ, the lamb of God without spot or blemish, as John the Baptist said. He will provide 
for himself, on behalf of himself, the lamb. The lamb, of course, here, literally, uh, in the thicket as they found him later, for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place where God told him, and Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood, and bound up his son. Why are you doing that, father? And he laid, on him, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. At this point, Isaac's probably a little nervous. We wonder if he had faith at this point, the faith of his father. Don't worry, son. The Lord is in this. I, I can't imagine. I, I mean, I've never seen this really dramatized, but, you know, panic has to start seizing the son. Going to be burned alive? Well, no, he's going to kill you. That's even, I mean, fine. <laughs> oh, I won't suffer. You're going to kill me. Because they would slit the throat of the lamb, you see, and drain out the blood. And so he would slit his throat with the with the sword, knife. And uh, so uh, uh, here it says, uh, verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. There it is. He's going to do it. Can you imagine? I mean, this is one of the most shocking episodes I think in all of scripture and it has to be shocking it's as shocking as killing the animals in animal sacrifice all through the old testament we have no idea how many millions and millions of animals were slaughtered under the system of the levitical system and it was because you would in many cases have a lamb that was kind of the family pet like we have a cat or a dog just imagine taking your family dog or cat and slitting their throat and letting them bleed out and die as a sacrifice to God. We wouldn't even think of doing that. I mean, there's some idiots out there that do that kind of behavior, but they have mental illness. They are deceived and deranged people. But to actually purposely kill the animal that's been in the house, especially on Passover, that lamb had to be without spot or blemish. They had particular care so that they were pure. Jesus Christ was sinless, and yet he took the most horrible, painful death that was available at that time through the Roman Empire. Angel of the Lord called to him. The angel uh, here of the Lord is, guess who? The Lord Jesus Christ. This is what's called a theophany. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. I have on my website, if you're interested, the study of the angel of Jehovah, the doctrine of the angel of Jehovah. We go through all the passages in the Old Testament that describe the angel of Jehovah. In the Old Testament, God, the second person, Jesus Christ, took upon himself the appearance of an angel. Many places, they actually took on the appearance of a burning bush at one time. Can you imagine? Here, the second person of the Trinity was a bush. The voice of God, Jesus Christ, came out of the bush. He came out of a cloud. He was even visible sitting on a dais at the top of that cloud called the Shekinah glory. Jesus Christ appeared as the angel of the Lord in a pre-incarnate appearance. Here he appears and he says, he called from heaven. He didn't even go down and appear. He simply called down a voice. And he said, don't stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to harm him. For now I know that you fear, Hebrew word yare, which means fear, scared to death, which Isaac probably was. But fear here is reverential. Oh, I know that you revere me. You revere God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked. And behold, uh, <coughs> Abraham went and took, let's see, behold, a ram. That's a male lamb, you see, a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son, just as Jesus Christ died in the place of all of us. This is symbolic. It is, as the pa passage calls it in Hebrews, a parable. This is a parable that goes beyond a parable. It's literal, but it has a parabolic prophetic meaning to it. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Adonai, Yireh, Yireh means will provide. I've been in churches where they actually say, God, the Lord will provide. That's one of the names of the Lord. And so the Lord is our provider. Every blessing that we have in this life or ever hope to have, every blessing in eternity is from the Lord, Adonai, Yireh. The Lord will provide. And of course, it's the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, but the Hebrews would not pronounce it. They would say, Adonai, Yira, the Lord will provide. And so he named this place, as it's called to this day. 
in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, be by myself. I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing in faith, of course, and I have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed. That is the plural sense of descendants as they translate it. As the stars of heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. And in your seed or descendants, here it is for us. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Man, I mean, is that amazing? Now that's what the writer of Hebrews has in mind when he says these few words in Hebrews. Let's go back now to Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering his only begotten son. Well, there's a lot going on here. We've already noted some of it. Uh, it says here that uh, he was the one having received the promises. We have the verb decomai, only found twice in the New Testament with the prefix ana, to receive again or to receive back. Having received back. Well, it, 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 Isaac didn't die, but it's as well, he could have died. And so he basically received him back here obviously, uh, uh, received, and the promises that uh, was, offer, was offering up the only begotten. And so the promises here that were made, obviously Isaac was one of the promises. It was the main one initially. But of course there couldn't be any descendants of Abraham apart from Isaac. So that blocked out that promise. And so uh, obviously he recognized that uh, <clears throat> he had received these promises and he was the one that received them. So he just trusted the Lord. Uh, the promises included the kings. Well, you can't have kings if you don't have descendants. Now, they could have got the land, but what good's the land without descendants to live there? So the promises, plural, include everything, including his son uh, who was offered up. That is his only son. We have the word offering up, which is prospero. Prospero comes from two Greek words, pros, the preposition, face to face, and pharaoh, which means to carry or to offer, to offer face to face or to offer forward. He offered forward his only begotten, doesn't say son, it just says monogenes. Monogenes, genes means born, and mono means unique or only born. Jesus was the only born son of God in the sense that he was born of Mary, and not of Joseph, but of Mary and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the only born son in that way. He had brothers and sisters, but he was the only born son of God through the Holy Spirit and Mary. So there's a parallel there. Okay, uh, so that brings us then to verse 18. Verse 18 says, uh, It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. The in it, it was he is not found in the text. They put it in italics, as we mentioned, because it, it continues the thought from verse 17. And so this is, uh, this is uh, Abraham by faith. It was, <clears throat> it was he to whom it was said. So it would be by faith Abraham to whom it was said. You could leave out those first words. They simply add that this is what Abraham was told in Isaac, your seed shall be called. This refers us back to Genesis 21, verse 12. Uh, we've already noted uh, 21, 12. I think we, well, I don't know if we saw that one, but uh, 21, 12. Also, in this connection, we might look at Romans, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> Romans chapter 9, 6 and 7. Romans 9, 6 and 7. Here we see as part of a, a testimony, obviously, and uh, so uh, here it talks about uh, it is not through the word of God, uh, 
let's see, let me back up here and pick it up in verse, uh, well, it's hard to know where to start with Paul, of course. At any rate, he's speaking about the fathers in verse 5, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, that is the incarnation, so Romans 9, 5, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed him forever, amen, in this section. And they said, but it is not as through the word, as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. What does he mean? Not all Israel are Israel. Well, when he speaks of Israel, he means spiritual Israel, those who've believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just because you're born in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a Hebrew, or later called a Jew, does not mean that you're a spiritual believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So not all Israel, then, are descended from who are descended from Israel uh, are of faith. Neither are all the children because they are Abraham's descendant. Just because you're a descendant of Abraham doesn't mean that you're a believer. But through Isaac, nevertheless, your seed will be named. So we have that there in verses 6 and 7. So again, the promise from the Old Testament tells us that the promise is going to be through Isaac, and Abraham understands that completely. And so that brings us then to the next verse, verses 19. So Hebrews 11, 19. And this really finishes up Abraham. So we had two sections all together. We had seven verses we noted of Abraham. Uh, we had the initial three, eight, nine, and 10. Then uh, the partial 11 and 12, but primarily 12. And then 17, 18, and 19 of the test with offering up Isaac. And here is the reason stated in the book of Hebrews, critical, critical passage. And so it starts off considering, we have the aorist middle participle. The participle shows ongoing action on the part of Abraham. The aorist tense is this event of the offering up of his son. And so the he goes all the way back to uh, uh, basically verse 17, and that is by faith Abraham, when he was tested, we have the fact that Abraham is the one considering. So this verse starts off with a participle, considering. They have placed the word he there in the Greek text uh, so that you understand it refers back to Abraham. There's no he in the original Greek. It's just a participle. Considering that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Who? Abraham. So they make it he considered. So considering that God, uh, here we have the God. Definite article referring to God the Father. The God the Father is able to raise even from the dead. The word men is not there, but obviously it's implied by the text. From the dead. It's interesting, the word for dead here is plural. It's necros, but it's plural, from the dead ones. Uh, it is a, an adjective used in a nominative sense, so that he can raise men from the dead. It's interesting, the word he is able is the Greek word dunitas. Uh, we often talk about dynamite. This is where we get the word dynamite from dunamis and dunatas and dunameo, the verb form. All of these have to do with God's ability to do whatever he wants. It describes the action of his omnipotence. God can do anything he wants, but he doesn't always do everything that he could do because obviously he allows free will, angelic free will, human free will. So God was able and so he considered that God the Father had the ability, he had the omnipotence, if you will, to raise men even from the dead ones. Raise is the word egairo. That means to raise up, like you might have someone sleeping and you raise them up out of bed. The idea is to raise someone out of the dead ones. The dead ones, of course, are in a place called Sheol in the Hebrew Old Testament and Hades in the New Testament. It's the place of all the dead before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of course, Abraham's bosom was where the believers went uh, in the Old Testament. Jesus picked them up when he was resurrected and took them to heaven because he was the first resurrected. And then he took with him all the Old Testament saints to be in his presence awaiting the dispensation of the church to reach <clears throat> its conclusion. Even from the dead, from which he also received him back. Oh, I love this. He received him back who? Isaac. Well, Isaac wasn't dead, but the idea here in the parable is that he received him back in this 
actual event that has a parabolic sense, yet with real people and a real historic event. Considering that God the Father was able through omnipotence to raise, obviously men, even from the dead ones, from which, from the dead ones, he, God the Father, is also, I'm sorry, he, small he, I'm sorry, this is Abraham, he also received him, Isaac, back as a type. And the word type, of course, is the word parable. By the way, the New American Standard actually puts it over there. I think they didn't like to use the word parable. Uh, and type works perfectly fine with me as a prophetic type or a parable. When we think of parables, we think of a story that Jesus told that maybe didn't actually happen, uh, but uh, it could have happened, and then the results and the teaching from that parable are used. However, we do have Lazarus and the rich man in Abraham's bosom considered to be a parable. It's the only one that's actually a fact and has real people involved. So we believe that's actually a true story, even though told as a parable. Well, here's another parable. The parable, and it's a true story, it's the act of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, yet not really, but as a parable, as a type. A type of what? A type of Jesus Christ, and that's what we have here. Now, this ability, this uh, power, uh, actually occurs in uh, several places in the book of Romans. I want to check those because they're really important. So before we close this verse, I want to look at Romans chapter 4, starting in 13. Romans 4, 13. Because he uses the word able, uh, ability, a number of times here. And we'll just see how it works. In Romans 4.13, For the promise to Abraham and to his seed, gee, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Paul's talking about the same thing that the writer of Hebrews does. That he would be heir of the world was not through the law. That's the Mosaic law. There was no law at that time. But through the righteousness of faith, by means of faith. Okay, so that's verse 13. Now there's more there, but skip down to 17. As it is written, a father of many nations, I have made you in the sight of him who had be who believed, even God, who gives life to the dead ones and calls into being that which does not exist. He's referring to this. In hope against hope, he believed in order that he might become a father of many nations. According to the, the uh, according uh, I'm sorry, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And then the last three verses. And without becoming weak in faith, listen to this, he contemplated his own body as good as dead since it was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, recanting the Old Testament. Yet, in reference to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. In other words, he exercised faith. But grew strong in faith, <clears throat> pardon me, giving glory to God, and then the critical passage, here it is, verse 21, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able to perform. So he was able to perform what? Bringing Isaac back from the dead. He didn't have to do that. He could have, but God stopped him. He said, enough. I know you're faithful. The beautiful story of the testing, not temptation, of Abraham and the fulfillment of that, even to raise men from the dead. Uh, and from there it says, uh, the last part of the verse we'll pick up next time, from where he received him back as a type. Well, we looked at that, and so uh, we'll come back at that point next time. Father, we're so grateful for these wonderful Old Testament passages that relate the historicity of of which the writer of Hebrews is reminding us in these few verses. The fact that this great father of antiquity, of the Hebrew people, and of us as spiritual children of his, can understand how his faith was demonstrated in this incredible episode of reality. And yet people today, even many people in the churches, have no idea of the greatness of the faith of Abraham or of any of these in chapter 11 of Hebrews, how sad that these are not taught and referenced back as the writer of Hebrews does to these Old Testament teachings of the reality of the Old Testament. We thank you so much for Abraham and his faith, for Sarah and the faith of all of these 
who didn't receive all of the promises, in some cases, none of those promises, but they will. And we look forward to that day when we will greet Abraham as he comes into that city that was promised to him thousands of years ago. <clears throat> And we will join with him at that marriage supper of the Lamb as he also encourages all of these uh, Old Testament saints, the uh, friends of the bridegroom. And we look forward to that day, Father. But for that one person who's here today without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know God had you in mind when he sent his son into human history, the God-man as the savior of the world, a sinless sacrifice, just like the sacrifices of the Levitical system, thousands and thousands upon thousands. And as the type, the parable, the true story of Abraham offering up his son, recognizing resurrection was imminent, that he was willing to give up his son, knowing and believing by faith the promise that his son, Isaac, and his descendants, Jacob and beyond, Joseph, all of those of the tribes of Israel, would populate the earth on into eternity throughout that millennial kingdom. What a joy. And you can be a part of the family, the spiritual family. If you are a Hebrew, you can believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are in the line of that family. But those of us who are Gentiles are just as much family, spiritual family, by faith. In Jesus Christ, we are joint heirs with Abraham's descendants. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, our Messiah. And you can have it right now, right where you sit, the privacy of your soul. You can think the words, I am believing in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he was willing to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you, God, for forgiving my sins and for giving me everlasting life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the moment of your salvation. God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son, his only called son, his only born in the incarnation son, that whosoever, anybody, put your name in there, anybody who believes, believes, faith is the issue, believe in what? Believes in him, Jesus Christ, will not perish but have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Father, again, thank you for this treasure trove of these Old Testament writings that give us clarification as to why we are believers in Jesus Christ and the blessings that we have in this life and the blessings that will accrue and rewards in eternity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. We pray all this in the majestic name of our Son, of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.